you know, there is at least 10 in each country or you know, more uh, because of the ethnic traditions, the theological positions of different communities, the fact that many people do believe in Islam but they don't feel uh, enough uh, connection with the local communities and the structures of Islam. So this is a, a problem for um, the way in which the EU conceptualizes Islam. But because of that um, particular article and the way in which it is formulated, it doesn't say that the EU will meet with the religious leaders. The EU says that the EU will be sensitive to the issues, the claims of religious communities and will be open to dialogue. And it doesn't say that these channels of dialogue have to happen with the religious leaders. And it doesn't say that these uh, dialogue opportunities have to be chaired by the President of the European Parliament or the European Commission. So there is an ambiguity there that is open to, I think, offering other ways, other informal ways or not so much developed ways of engaging as a, as a religious actor in the political system, but outside of the box in which we think about religion on a domestic level and on a European level. Why? Because the EU has <coughs> a very complex mechanism of policy making that involves many institutions, but also is very extremely interested in, in legitimizing itself as a public uh, affairs thing, but also is interested in making Europe generally more transparent and more um, uh, and more sensitive to citizens. So the way in which policies are decided and made into the EU involves very often uh, the participation of experts <coughs> in uh, ad hoc groups that they, maybe the Commission or the Parliament call to give evidence on something. So here is already a channel for Muslim actors. Uh, <coughs> A broad, in a broad sense, Muslim political actors in a broad sense, even if they're not community leaders, even if they're not imams, even if they are not, you know, uh, part of a, of, a, of a community. There is a way to inject views through these uh, groups of experts. There is uh, um, lobbying groups. Lobbying groups uh, have increased hugely, exponentially, in the course of the 1990s, and the place for lobbying groups typically is the parliament. So in the parliament, uh, you have a lot of scope for businesses, for NGOs, to try to influence, or at least to throw their views into the game, and to talk to politicians who then decide whether to take in these views or not. And uh, in, in one of my articles you will see, I've actually studied the number of opportunities recently that have happened inside the European Parliament and how frequently Muslim individuals, <coughs> Muslim organizations in particular, have been invited to give evidence or have been given just a space to uh, discuss the issues of Muslim women, the veil, uh, freedom of religion, a number, a number of things, or the future of political Islam. Actually, I was almost shocked by the openness through which the European Parliament, uh, a naivety in a way, I thought, in which the European Parliament had opened the doors for anybody to come in, which is, in a way, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting because, in a way, yes, it is part of this probably genuine attempt to make the Parliament more representative of the true population of Europe, but I think there is also a selfish uh, sort of hypocritical agenda there. That the parliament is the less weighty of all the political institutions of the EU, the more criticized, um, the one where people vote less for when there are European elections. So maybe the parliament needed these Muslim uh, organizations as well as the environmentalists, <coughs> as well as the Christians, whatever to legitimize its own position in the eyes of the citizens. And so it's a vicious circle because then these organizations who attend the meetings with the politicians can show off and say that they've been invited to Brussels so they are important and then the politicians say, oh, I, am, I know the issues affecting this community or this 
a problem because I have been in touch with the practitioners, with the people. So what are the uh, actors that are operating here in, in, in Brussels in particular uh, on a faith-based level? Well, the most organized, uh, the longer established, obviously, are the Christian groups. Uh, and second, you have all the denominations uh, and the institutional structure of religious traditions obviously facilitates, for instance, Catholics are particularly well organized. Uh, then you have the Jewish communities who um, are also have a number of uh, pressure groups that are present and operating in Brussels, but they are less visible. They are only targeting certain issues. And I would say, I would like to call the Christians primarily, and to an extent the European Jewish Congress, but not other Jewish organizations, institutional official representations. Because in, at least in the Christian traditions, there is a clear hierarchical structure. So those who say that they are representatives of the churches, they may be criticized by the members of those communities, those faith communities, but no one disputes the fact that in the structure of those churches, they have an authoritative position. Whereas in Islam, it is more difficult to position yourself uh, as an authority, even if maybe you are accepted from a, or one particular local group. In fact, the, and this is not only my understanding, if you look at the way in which these organizations present themselves to the EU institutions, the churches say that they are the representative of the Catholics and of the Protestants or the Orthodox. Muslims don't say that these two, three organizations, there is the Federation of European Muslim Youth Organizations, the European Federation of Islamic Organizations, and there is the European Women Network, Muslim Women Network, and the European Muslim Network will stop. They don't say that they are representing the Muslims. They don't even try to go down that avenue which is the traditional Western way of understanding religion in, in a hierarchical structure, and which then demands special laws and special constitutional arrangements. They completely bypass that hierarchical understanding of religion, and they present themselves as issue-based. I, yeah, I represent the interests of Muslims, and of Muslim women in particular. And they are active in particular for self-promotion for uh, uh, demystifying bad views or prejudices about Muslims. So they do, they do not promote many activities for, uh, like on a practical level for the Muslim community, but they are, uh, I would say, 90% focused on a PR exercise. The PR exercise is there for everybody, because it, it, despite everything, the atmosphere is in, in Brussels is still uh, be anti-religion in general in, in a secularized uh, Western context. So for all religious groups have to have a bit of effort in a PR. But the Muslims in particular are dedicated to demystifying prejudices about Muslims rather than doing things for Muslim communities. Whereas other, for instance, other groups within the, the, the Christian Groups. For instance, they are specialized in advocacy for migrants. There is the Jesuit uh, uh, um, office that <coughs> goes to asylum seekers. There is the um, education, uh, the Christian education uh, network. Uh, there is uh, Caritas, which are faith-based NGOs that are 100% clear about their religious position, but they are there to serve a particular uh, part of society in the name of the religion, whereas this is not so evident. You have Islamic Relief, yes, it's one of the uh, eight organizations that are, have an international uh, feature among Muslim NGOs, but it, this is it's much, much less of a characteristic. <coughs> and then what is interesting, you have another type of NGOs, again, that they are able to inject values and issues that are of concern to Muslim communities but without presenting themselves under a religious face. For instance, NR, which is the European Network Against Racism, for a number of years now, the, the, the president and the people in the board are Muslims. So this shows that obviously there is a lot of sensitivity and 
sense of responsibility also within the Muslim community to fight racism and to fight what is often defined as Islamophobia. I don't like the term Islamophobia, but many uh, Muslim uh, activists uh, insist on it. And I find that actually the way to um, to fight Islamophobia and the way to change the view of Islam is not to act in the name of Islam, but actually to act through a normal civic society uh, association and, and then basically uh, inject your views in that way. Uh, so and then obviously you have mosques and other organizations, but what I'm saying is that basically if you look at this typology, and you could uh, perhaps uh, make an even more sophisticated typology, what you learn from this is actually that this, the political field in general, but also in particular the way of the, in which the machine works in Brussels, has allowed for a multiplication of channels for faith groups in general to participate in the political process without being themselves official representatives, without um, going through what is normally was expected to be the place where the voice of, from, of Muslim communities comes, basically the mosques. The majority of the activism is not come, of this type of activism does not come from the mosque. It's civil society associations, it is networks, it is uh, issue-based NGOs, Maybe, yes, there is some uh, religious um, particular uh, scholar that is behind the scenes, like uh, Tariq Ramadan is behind the European Muslim Network, but uh, there is no is, is institutional religious structure behind this. And this, in a way, sort of frees the participation of Muslim communities into this uh, uh, sort of web of, um, of, of uh, openings that exist in Brussels for engaging with the youth. Um, and here are some uh, um, examples of involvement in uh, policy processes, um, like the Famizon uh, uh, DFOE that promote their values and will do full stop, or uh, others that are there and are very actively responding to EU consultations about issues that are not about religion, like stem cells research, or uh, the, you know that the EU has been very strict with working hours, has put a limit to the working hours in a week, um, and many people have complained about. Basically, uh, many religious groups mobilized to ensure that Sunday was left free from work, on because that's uh, um, one aspect of the freedom of practicing your religion. But I did not. It was was very interesting. Uh, is that in this case it wasn't Muslim, it was Christians, but. They mobilized not by putting forward the religious aspect first. They basically uh, hid their religious agenda by going along the lines of the wording of the consultation and the issues that were dictated by Brussels. So in doing this, also the, the, the language that is used and the the identity also of these uh, religious actors who are part of this broad net of policy processes, they are changing basically their own identity. Another example to go back to the Muslim thing is the creation um, <coughs> of Islamic organizations in Europe when in 2006, I think, if I'm not wrong, they uh, launched the European Muslim Charter. Um, it was a it was a, a, a PR exercise, and it was a very neutral, in a way, it, a very diluted, I think, um, way of presenting their own position because the organization, well, the founders of the Federation of Islamic Societies in Europe, are part of the European branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, and. If you have in mind the writings of Albana and all the uh, traditional activities and uh, rhetoric of the Muslim Brothers, look at Egypt now, and then you read this document, there is a, a big gap. And basically you wonder, basically by being in Europe and by operating into this system, 
what is left of the Muslim Brotherhood network? What's the purpose, even, you, you ask yourself? Because of the way in which this statement has been diluted in order to present a nice view of what Muslims think of democracy that is going to be liked by uh, the European audience. So uh, there is this very, very strange uh, um, cross. And also there's uh, lots of alliances that are building up that are cutting across <laughs> religious groups that are in a way contradicting the expected uh, um, clash between religions. For instance, in Ireland there was a, a campaign against abortion where Christians and Muslims campaigned together. So uh, basically, uh, what I'm saying is, is, is this level of civil society participation, and in particular, uh, the transnationalism of civil society participation nowadays, and the um, savviness also through which these uh, religious organizations have begun to understand how politics works, and in particular, how the EU institutions work, have enabled them to participate perhaps more than before, but bypassing the traditional structures that were there until very recently for us to conceive of a role for religion in society. I, what I'm arguing here is that uh, church-state relations, debates about how to restructure the church, it becomes irrelevant because the mobilization happens by bypassing this happens at the level of market society. Lobbying groups are, are responding to the market, and so uh, religious groups are also uh, responding to this. Um, despite all these, uh, uh, these levels of European Muslim mobilization, we can see the variety of uh, mobilization. We can see that um, there is an extremely limited number of Muslims who are active in Brussels. So the EU level has a lot of potential to mobilize across Europe, to raise support beyond your national lines. But at the end of the day, basically, Muslim communities are facing the same problems as any other European citizen in Europe, which is that you are tied to your local level, so you keep your primary level of activism, your primary level of loyalty to the national level. Uh, so I'm not saying that um, the, the national level is going to disappear, but we are going to have these uh, multiple levels of uh, articulation of, uh, and possibilities for political participation of uh, Muslim communities. So when people are